my job is to get as many creative angles as I can, whether that's a close, a wide, a different angle. I mean, this, the good thing about a jellyfish is they're not moving very fast, mm -hmm. unlike something like a dolphin or a shark where you're working to different parameters. But if that was just a photo of a jellyfish, I don't think it would have done anywhere near what it what ended up doing. Shark explorer, you know, a man interested in sharks. Both of those are pretty I mean, How would you introduce yourself? I mean, I, my, my job is underwater cinematographer. Um, but mm -hmm. I would say that the sharks are, uh, they've, they've been around since the very big, like in terms of my interest, it was the sharks first. Like I, I learned to become a cinematographer mm -hmm. because of sharks. I learned to scuba dive because of sharks. So yeah, the, the shark side of it is, is the main thing, I guess. Shark you know, um, or, when you, yeah. you know, when you're diving with lemon sharks, you know, it's a pretty, that's one thing, but have you been diving with um, great whites? Um, not outside of a cage. Uh, where I worked in South Africa, I worked on the cage diving boat. So um, we didn't allow anyone outside of the cage. It's actually illegal in most places. Um, yeah. Other species, tigers, bulls, hammers. Yeah, ev everything else outside of the cage. I mean, I think I, I, I saw your, one of your TED, your TED talk and you said you started drawing sharks when you were a little kid that this fascination, but what, what is it something, was it jaw? Like, what was it? <laughs> um, it certainly wasn't Jaws. I didn't see that till I was about probably 14 or 15, I think. Um, it, I, th I mean, my grandmother was really into wildlife. And so she would always have drawings and fact files and documentaries going on. And I think she knitted me a great white shark when I was like two weeks old or something like that. So mm. I, I, to be honest, I think all kids are fascinated by sharks when they're kids, sharks and dinosaurs. Those are the two things mm -hmm. all kids love. <laughs> like when I do schools talks, it doesn't take much to try and get them excited about sharks. <laughs> they, they already like now, them. Now, the first time in the cage, this is a very different animal. How big was the first one that you saw? Uh, well, the great white shark was the first shark that I saw. So it was the one that I wanted to see first. Um, I think the first one on the first day was about two and a half meters, maybe. Um, and then on the second day, there was a four meter female that turned up. Um, yeah, so. For the, for, the, uh, for the Americans, can you translate the meters so we understand oh, boy. how big what's, we're talking what's, about? What's four meters in, what do you measure things in? Feet, right? Yeah, so that's that's about twelve feet. Yeah, yeah or uh, sixteen so, yeah. feet. Yeah, bigger. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, okay. four meters. Probably my my calculations are way off. <laughs> but it's but it's way bigger than you. So what are you oh, thinking yeah. when you see it when it's coming towards you? You know, only excitement. Yeah, I think um, I I never really had a f the fear around them because I've always been obsessed with them, and mm -hmm. and the fear side of it doesn't really come into play when you're when you just love to learn about an animal. And um, I mean, I was reading fact files on great white sharks when I was like a young kid. And um, I was watching documentaries about them when I was, you know, a, you know, young. And I just, just seeing them was my objective. And I, I don't think there was ever a fear moment. You know, we don't know much about them because of course they're under the sea. You know, we don't know their migration patterns and what they do, you know, what, what do you, what do you kind of, you know, what do you want to say about the shark? Cause it's such a misunderstood uh, character of the ocean. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we, we don't know that much about them, but I think um, we, we know enough to know how to try and protect them. They are learn where they go, but actually I think we, we have a fairly good idea where they go. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they're, they're incredibly misunderstood. I understand the, the fear side of it that people have about them, but we usually fear things that we don't particularly understand. Um, so yeah, it is, it is one of those animals that always seems to strike that kind of response to most people. But what we found on the cage diving boat, which is where I worked predominantly in South Africa, is usually that fear very, very quickly turns into fascination just by learning a little bit about it or seeing it doing something that, it didn't know, that they didn't know that it did. And that, yeah. I mean, really, that's, that's kind of what cage diving is and what it does. And it kind of shows people the real animal, the truth behind it. And it works the same for everything. Once you start learning a little bit more about something, an animal, anything, you, 
you lose the fear and you kind of gain a little bit more of the the respect, the reverence, the the awe behind it. Um, do you ever feel like, wow, I'm glad I'm in this cage when I'm looking at this animal? To be honest, I, ne I, I never stayed in the cage that long, not because I didn't enjoy it, but I found it far more interesting being on the boat. Because when you're on the boat, especially on the top deck, and you can start to see all of the sharks around the boat, because the cage mm. gives you kind of like that 10 second flash of teeth, flash of skin, flash of fins, and then it's gone. You kind of have to wait for the next one. But on the top, you can watch several individuals, maybe 10 individuals all moving around, interacting not just with the boat, but with each other. I, I found that more interesting. And you know, I actually got into the cage maybe only twice or so in the first week that I, I did cage diving. The rest of the time I was on the top. You know, what are we to learn? What, what, are, what is misunderstood about it? I mean, what are the things, you know, we're all afraid or I would definitely be afraid. I can't even go in a swimming pool without hearing that soundtrack. Okay, that's <laughs> Um, but what 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 do you love about the great white and what do we sh what should we know to make us have more respect or at least try to understand um, what I learned about them is um, that well the thing that blew my mind very very quickly is just how personality driven they are and how no two sharks are the same and um, it's kind of like I mean we all need some and this sort of thing and this is what I pretty much based my TED talk on is the idea around that great white sharks respond and behave because of personality and where one great white shark might be curious about something and go and investigate the next one might want nothing to do with it and actually be a little bit nervous timid and and leave the area um so i think when we start putting those that kind of when we start thinking about them in that sort of way some of their behavior actually doesn't seem that strange anymore and and the ways that they want to interact with different things makes a lot more sense um, so yeah, that's usually when I'm talking to people about sharks or like doing a school's talk or whatever it is, I just try and show them the animal as, as an animal that is also curious and also interested in its world, especially juveniles. Man, juvenile great white sharks are one of the most curious animals I've ever filmed. <laughs> they mm -hmm. are just fascinated by life and stuff and they go looking and, and exploring things. And that's, I mean, I guess most juvenile animals do that, but and it, but are they afraid? Yeah, interesting. You, you know, are they afraid, or are they just, you know, kind of ch checking it out? And and what is it? What would prompt a, What would prompt an attack on another creature? Uh, I think some of them probably are afraid, or not perhaps not afraid, but perhaps cautious, because the way it works in in if you imagine yourself as a great white shark, if you're smaller than the next great white shark that's that's coming along, then you don't have rights in the pecking order to go for the food or to, 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 to be in that area. So you have to give that other shark a little bit of space. And you'll be pleased to know that females are the ones in charge <laughs> uh, when it comes to great white sharks. They're usually a bit bigger. So what we generally find is if we get a big female around the boat, all the, all the males, they back right off. She's large and they give each other a lot of respect in terms of space. When it comes to use the word attack, uh, when it comes to perhaps being aggressive, towards another shark, um, for example, would be if that shark has disrespected the, that, that law of, of the sharks, which is the biggest has priority. And occasionally there'll be a young one that tries its luck, pushes it a bit, maybe gets in the way. And I've not seen it, but I've, I've heard of stories where a, a larger shark will try and take a bite out of a younger one, not to try and do too much damage, but just to put them back in their place. So like a mm. horse would nip at a little foal or something, exactly. you know, and hurting them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, wow, the intelligence is, so they're really intelligent. I, I believe so, yeah, I believe so. I, th I think a lot of the, um, the misunderstanding around sharks is that they're making mistakes all the time. Every time they bite a person, it's a mistake. Or they see a surfer and they think it's a seal and they've made a mistake. And I have a hard time getting on with that because I, I don't see them making many mistakes. I mean, if you think about how many opportunities they have to make mistakes, not just great whites, but all sharks, uh, there'll be people being bitten and ripped apart every single day. Um, but considering how many opportunities they have to make mistakes, they make so few mistakes. It's actually really amazing how few mistakes they make. They, they do know what their food is. I guess that when I think about the intelligence level, how would they 
be compared to like a whale. You know, we think of a whale as, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I've read a lot that whales are super, super intelligent, but I'm just curious, you know, it, where if we think they're on a pecking order of, of intelligence, I guess. I think, I mean, great white sharks are on the high end of intelligence as, as far as fish go, but they are still a fish. So they are still, most of their behavior is because of instinct and how they've evolved to be. Um, there really isn't a comparison between a fish and a mammal, which of course is right. what a whale is. Right. Um, yeah, whales will show far more intelligence when it comes to social interaction and, and mothers and calves will, will interact and things like that. So yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever put a great white shark on the same sort of level as, um, as something like a whale, um, but certainly on the high end of the fish scale. Right, okay, curious. Um, what do you think the shark is out there trying to do? You know, is it, is it just trying to eat? Is it trying to explore its environment? Like how is it thinking about what it's seeing? A lot of it is, is, is just trying to survive. The main difference that between the mammals, for example, and the sharks is um, let's take something like a killer whale. Um, a mother killer whale will teach its calf to feed. Sometimes, mm -hmm. like in Argentina, for example, they'll push their calves onto the beach so they can learn to get off the beach again when they're catching seals. Uh, great white sharks don't have anything like that. So the moment a great white shark, great white shark or, any, or most sharks are born, they're on their own from, from second one. So their whole life is a learning process to try and figure out how to survive, what to avoid, what to eat, what not to eat. And that's predominantly most of what, especially with the juveniles, which is the ones that I've worked with the most, that's what they're trying to do, which is why we perhaps see more behavior like them bumping into things or them trying to just take a little bite out of something or lifting half their head out of the water to look above the surface to actually look at their surroundings, mm -hmm. um, which we call spy hopping. Um, all these things is a juvenile learning more about its, its world, which they have to do by themselves. You know, do they have to reach a certain scale before they become the A predator? Like, do they have to rise through a ranks of, of, of competition? Yeah, a lot of that will depend on where in the world they are. Um, great white sharks do have some natural predators. Uh, well, great white sharks have one natural predator, to be more correct on that. The killer um, whale? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is the killer whale trying to eat the shark? Like, what's the killer whale trying to do? More often than not, the, the bit that the, the orca, the killer whale, will be after is the liver, mm. which is the bit that's going to give them the most benefit for trying to catch a, a great white. And they hunt in packs, right? So yeah. do they, do they uh, see a shark and then all get together and go after the shark? And does the shark have some counter tactics that it can use to fight the killer whale off? Not easily. <laughs> if a pod of killer whales decide they want to take down a white shark, there's not a lot that white shark is going to be able to do about it. You know, they have sense, the right? Their, their, their noses are super developed and they feel... Is it like a little bit, of, they can sense, um, you know, I don't know what it would be, but like the, anything that's breathing under the water. So does that, does that give them some ability to, to what, what's the superpower of the shark in terms of locating its prey? Um, they have two senses that are different to most mammals. One is called the lateral line, which runs down the side of its body and means they can detect movement in the water at quite a close range of Lorenzini, which is basically a way of detecting electromagnetic fields in the water, which every living mm -hmm. thing gives off. So they'll use those two um, senses to hone in on prey. Predominantly, it's, it's through hearing and it's through smell. That'll be the thing mm. that they use first. Um, they actually, their hearing is fantastic. And that's usually the thing they'll pick up on first. Um, a group of sea lions porpoising through the water, a distressed fish that's the things that they're trying to pick up on um you know some sharks live to be very very old right some of the oldest living things on the planet like can you tell us about those sharks and how do we know anything about sure, them yeah. yeah the oldest shark i mean do you know how old the oldest shark gets I, it's it's some astounding amount of time right like is it uh i want to say it's like a no, no, much older, right? They're some of the oldest things on the planet, yeah? Yeah, the, the Greenland shark is the one that lives for the longest. 
and yeah. if my history is correct i believe it if there are possibly greenland sharks out there right now that are older than the united states of america no yeah no <laughs> no yeah and they estimate around 400 years yeah and they're they're blind right because they live very deep um that is well, yes. So every shark that we have discovered has been blind. I don't think it's the case that they are born blind. Mm. Um, it's that there are um, copepods, like tiny little um, creatures that gradually eat away at the shark's eye. So oh, wow. Um, wow. yes, uh, to, to our knowledge, like, like, like I say, to our knowledge, because no one's seen one being born, <laughs> um, we believe they're born with sight and then they gradually go blind. Yeah. But what you was the... What would be the reason for that? Like how, what is going on there in an ecosystem? Like they, you know what I mean? Like, how does, what does that mean? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I haven't studied Greenland sharks too much, but it's certainly an animal I would like to have more experience of. Um, although it involves getting in very, very, very cold water. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of and the- deep water, right? Really deep. Fairly deep, yeah. Occasionally yeah. they'll come shallow. They scavenge a lot, so it depends on where the food is. Um, but for them, isn't it like the uh, what do you call it when it's the, the stuff just falls down from you right. know dead animals fall? Yeah. What do you call that? Twilight uh, or something? Hanging fruit. <laughs> Name. But you mean like getting their food down at the bottom? Like falls a scavenger from up yeah. above. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because we found remains of polar bears inside of. Um, certain Greenland sharks. So yeah, I, I certainly don't think it's the case that they're hunting polar bears. So yeah, that would be the case of where the bears gone sick, fallen in the water, and then the shark finishes it off. Um, the, in general, sharks are scavengers, aren't they? Uh, it depends, species to species. Some of them will rely on uh, trying to scavenge more than others. Uh, that those usually are what we call pelagic species which spend their whole lives in the vast ocean, um, moving around all the time, which, which great white sharks are a part of. Yeah. Um, so that's just kind of, basically it's, it's getting what you can find. Um, which and they, kind of they migrate for thousands of miles? Yeah, my, uh, white sharks will travel, they'll cross oceans. Yeah, mm. there was one very famous shark named Nicole that was documented traveling from South Africa to Australia and back to South Africa again. So uh, yeah, they they travel huge distances. Yeah, and and do we understand why they travel these distances? Uh, not completely, but we can take some educated guesses. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of animals will travel huge distances for breeding purposes, for feeding purposes. They definitely know the times of year when the prey is more abundant than others. Right. Um, in in South Africa, we there was a huge increase in white shark numbers in the bay that we were working in, in the winter time, which is when the baby seals would start leaving. Um, so they do travel to areas because of food reasons. Now, do, um, they, do they know that it's a food reason or is it the same reason that the seal knows to go back to that same beach? Because they do a long migratory thing as well. So is it just yeah. built in or do we know, do we know how they make that decision? The, yeah, my answer to that would be, I, I think it's, um, built in, but over, over a long, long period of time. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these, these evolutionary sort of patterns are so old and we understand so little about them. Can we keep these species alive? One of the ways that we try and protect certain species is creating these areas called marine protected areas, which will protect a specific space. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things I'm currently doing here in the Mediterranean with the company that I work with. But of course, the problem with that is the animals don't know it's a marine protected area. So the next minute they could be somewhere else. Although so, we're already seeing in those places, you see a lot of, you know, the species coming back. Yeah. yeah Just when absolutely. there are people messing around with them, the lot comes back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one example is, is literally just where I live here. There's a marine protected area. And in the last 10 years, the biodiversity and biomass of the fish in that area has has. It, yeah, it, it's so, so much more um, abundant than it, than it has been. Do they have fishing there? We do have fishing uh, in, the, in the MPA, the Marine Protected Area, it's managed. So for certain mm -hmm. months of the year, you can fish, but there's a huge limit on what you can take and what kind mm -hmm. of fishing you can do. And then the rest of the year, it's, it's a no fishing zone, which is the times of year when there's a lot of breeding and spawning and, and that kind of thing going on. 
and that's you, that's the reason it's it's much better than it was you know they have those deep subs that sometimes will pull up a picture of a giant squid or a or a, you'll see these sharks do you do you watch those things ever and are you surprised by the what's out there in the ocean that we know nothing about no not not i mean su not surprised no i mean we know so little about the the depths of the ocean um mm -hmm. I have a, a friend actually who was involved in filming the second ever time a giant squid was caught on camera in U.S. Mm -hmm. waters. Mm -hmm. um, very famous piece of footage. And yeah, I mean, there's animals down there that we have no idea about. Um, that's one of the exciting things about it, I think, is because we really don't have a clue what's out there, uh, which makes yeah, people the ocean people exciting. want to explore Mars, but they could just spend a lifetime exploring the ocean. A hundred percent. Do, yeah. do you have any idea, Dan, like how old they, I mean, the kind of how far back we go, you know, you talk, you related them to dinosaurs, but how many, are they the early, early species? Of sharks? Yeah. Um, they were certainly around long before the dinosaurs, um, long before trees. Uh, we estimate around 400 million years was when the first shark uh, yeah. form was around. Yeah. They're, now it's hard because it's on the planet. It's hard because you can't study any of their skeletons, really, right? Exactly. They, they disappear, you know? Exactly, yeah, which is why teeth are the... the... How do they know that? I mean, you know, what, what is the scientific me method by which they could measure that it's maybe 400 million years old? What is the thing? That's a great question. Um, I myself would probably be asking that question to a scientist. <laughs> right. um, to be honest, I, I know don't know. We're asking you, like, but... we know you're a cinematographer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, we should probably be asking you a little bit about. I mean, you guys are asking questions that I want to know the answers to. Yeah. Right. Well, we you, want to. When you're, <laughs> Go on. when you're down there, are you ever scared when you're behind the camera? No, I've never, I've never had a, a moment filming sharks where I felt like I was, I was in any kind of danger. I've been in situations where it, it was less than ideal, um, but uh, no, never, never a moment where it feels like this is a really bad place to be right now. We need to get out. Now, do they do when you do cage diving? You don't just keep the cage on the side of the boat. You drop it down. Yeah. No, in South Africa, we operate where the cage is attached to the side of the boat. Right. Yeah. In some places like Australia, they'll, they'll have a, a, a bottom cage. But for us, because it was a much more kind of day trip kind of market that we advertise to so it's people just coming for a quick trip and then and then out you know um how hard is that to get a good shot inside one of those cages oh wow nice oh, that me. You know? <laughs> so what's uh, yeah what's happening <laughs> uh this is an oceanic black tip shark being followed by uh some some remoras uh this is in south africa, mm. africa. I mean, to kind of answer your question, that, that obviously the best way to film these animals is without bars in the way. Mm -hmm. And it is quite right. difficult uh, in South Africa. And I, to be honest, I don't have many good shots of great white sharks that I've filmed from the cage because it is very mm -hmm. difficult. They're moving very fast and it's kind of more of a flash and then it's gone. Uh, my best shots of white sharks has, has been from the surface, either breaching or using a drone. Right. Um, to get really nice close images of other species, then that's when the scuba diving element comes in and kind of like tiger sharks and hammerheads and bull sharks and like this oceanic black tip. You kind of just position yourself in a, in a way that isn't going to look too intimidating for them and allow your body language to tell them that you're not a threat because that would be the first thing that they're concerned about. Do, do you feel like you're communicating with them when you're photographing them? On, on some level, yes. Uh, and I think you have to. Um, you're... I mean, I wouldn't say so far that I'm communicating in a way that I'm speaking to them, but I'm just holding myself as, as confident, not being erratic with movement. And because those are the kinds of things that sharks will perhaps get a little bit excited about. But if you hold yourself as essentially another predator in the water, which is what I, I believe most of the time they see us as when they see us underwater, um, then they will treat you with the same sort of respect that they treat each other. Like I was saying earlier with the white sharks, how they'll kind of give each other space and give each other room. I've, uh, sharks, have, sharks do that to us when, when we um, give that same sort of body language away. I, so, I have a question. You, that's close. I mean, to me, that looks really close. I'm not sure, that, you know, the scale. But is it the thing like, you know, when you're riding a horse or when I would ride a horse, like the, the smell, the scent, like if you're afraid, 
the horse knows it. Do you think that when you talk about the body language, is there is there a posture, or you say if you if you see a wild moose, like don't run, you know? Look yeah. Down. Oh man, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So what would be some of those? What are the kind of safety like? Anyone listening who happens to run into one of these things? Sure. These yeah. I, I mean, the <laughs> first thing I would say, and I got asked this a lot by surfers in South Africa, especially when there were white sharks around, and surfing is a slightly different context. But the first thing I would say is, if you can make eye contact with it then it's lost its element of surprise. Most sharks rely on ambush, especially the big ones. So if it knows it's been seen, it can't, and you sometimes see seals swimming like right in front of sharks or like over the top of them. They're, they're kind of like going, you know, you're there. And then the shark's like, I can't do anything now because they've lost their element of surprise. So the first thing is eye contact. Um, and then, um, and you're absolutely right about the horse example where they're perhaps picking up on fear. And people ask me a lot, can sharks smell fear? And my response to that usually is they can't smell fear, but they see the response to fear. So our response to fear might be moving around a little bit too much in the water, breathing really heavily, blowing bubbles. All these kinds of things are behaving in a way that is, is not perhaps particularly normal. And these are the kinds of things that sharks pick up on. That's how they've evolved. If a, if a, if a fish is stressed, that's, that's what the shark is, has adapted, has evolved to get good at detecting. So if you're presenting yourself much calmer, then it has to look at you as something different. What lens is that? It looks like a super wide lens, or is that yeah, a it is. water? It is. Yeah, a it is. Yeah. So, it's, so you have to um, be very cool. close to, you have to be very close to make that work, yeah? Um, sometimes it depends on the kind of shots that you want. Um, yeah, with, with that lens, I think it's about 170 degree angle. Mm. Um, but I've got the option to take that lens off underwater if I really needed to get in close. But usually when I'm filming big stuff like sharks or dolphins or alligators, then I, I want to be able to fit in as much as the animal as possible. Um, and I can get pretty close to these animals. So, um, it doesn't, I've got a zoom function as well. So if I really needed to so what do you do? You have to reach your hand into the bellows and try and change something in there, like while you're uh, underwater? Or the, the, the housing that I use, um, I can control every aspect of the camera mm. um, on the housing. Uh, it's made by a, an organization called Nauticam who build housings which are specific, dedicated to the camera that goes inside. So and it's a yeah. digital, it's a digital camera. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Are you shooting film at the same time you're shooting pictures? With most of my work, I usually will just do video. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would call myself then they a take a frame out or something. Yeah, because of the resolutions that we now film at, it's, it's high enough quality to be able to, as you say, take a screen grab or something and use that as a photo. Now, the alligator so ironically, that... yeah, ironically, the, um, the thing that most people know me for is a photo, which, <laughs> which is kind of uh, one of life's right. ironies. It always, <laughs> always turns out that way. So um, people think I'm a photographer, but I, I don't emphasize myself as one. Now, an alligator just sort of hangs in the water. So do you, do you, and you know, it's very different than a shark, I would imagine. Not that I'm really spending any time with either of these characters, but when you're filming an alligator with that lens, are you ever worried it's going to just shh on you? Or do you, do, do, uh, if you're underwater, you know, they're not very, they don't move very well on land, but underwater they can do ballet, yeah? Oh man, yeah, they're, they're, they're extremely flexible. Um, well, with the situations that I've been in filming alligators, um, it's been, again, a lot about presenting yourself as not food. And actually, I mean, in, in America, for example, the American alligator, they predominantly will eat fish. So right. humans aren't really ever on a possible menu, as a, as a menu option. But mm -hmm. if they feel threatened or they think you're coming at them in some way, then yeah, sure, they'll, they'll defend themselves. So it's just trying to make yourself look fairly big and, and let the animal know that it's, uh, it's not a food opportunity. You know, are you attracted all the time to, to these animals that are, you know, I mean, they're stereotypically, uh, you know, these are really going after some wild animals here. You know, are you, is that... Is part of it the danger? Is that what you're attracted yeah, to? Yeah, I think, I think I am drawn to predators. Yeah. Um, not perhaps for the danger side of it, but um, 
I just I think I've always been fascinated by predators, sharks, killer whales, lions, the animals that have the big teeth. Like those are the ones that I I think I generally find more interesting to be around. And um, yeah, I would, I would definitely say that's kind of my um, my where my interest is. Have you filmed tigers in the wild? I haven't. No, I haven't done that much land based camera work. Um, mostly because now, I know if if you were going to do that. How would you have to prepare your mind for that? <clears throat> I mean, you know, people go look at a, <clears throat> a tiger in the zoo, they think it's one thing, but out in the wild, this is the top predator. It'll, you know, and, and they're just wild. You know, you, yeah. you can't, uh, you're not gonna tame a, a wild tiger. I mean, how would you think about that? If you, what do you have to do to get your mind right before you start? That's a great question. Um... I think if I was, it was, if someone was to give me a call tomorrow and say, we need you to go and film tigers, then um, I would, my first point of action would be to make sure I was with someone that knew these animals better than I did. And yeah. most of the time when you watch like the, the big BBC docs and stuff, obviously the, the cameraman is the one they're getting the shots, but right next to him is the guy that's been studying these animals for the whole of his life. And he knows where they're going to be, when they're going to be. And, and then it's just down to a lot of waiting and a lot of, being in the right place at the right time. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a very, very difficult animal to get a glimpse of. Now, are you, like, is there a group of people out there who just study sharks so that you're, a, you're part of a community of people who are looking for them and looking at alligators? Or, I mean, I can't imagine there'd be that many people who do this, are there? Um, it feels like there are, but that's, <laughs> I mean, I guess, the circles that I generally mix in are with people that are doing the same sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I know quite a lot of people that work in the shark world, both as camera operators, scientists, conservationists, tour operators. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the shark world is quite a, a, quite a community of people around the world, uh, and, and especially in America, where I've done quite a few, few things. So is half your world uh freelance drumming and being in bands and half your world being with shark you know with uh, shark people yeah i actually haven't played drums in <laughs> so the job that i have now in in the mediterranean in majorca uh is now my full-time mm. uh my full-time job so for a long time i was doing the drumming which was allowing me to buy things like cameras which right. are not cheap especially and uh but now i'm now an, an ngo is paying me to go out and film things like sperm whales and and uh and mantas and tuna. So yeah, I'm fortunate to be able to say this is the, the full-time job. Do we know yes. how many um, uh, species of sharks there are? Do they know? Um, I don't think anyone will give you a specific answer, but we know it's over 450, maybe around the 500 mark. Um, the reason no one will give you a specific answer is because we're still discovering new ones. I think it was last year or the year before, um, there was a new species of hammerhead <laughs> that was discovered that no one knew existed and of course you we're know, still discovering new things in the depths as well so yeah i think it's around that number you know sperm whales and um manta rays you know you sort of know where they are but how do you figure out where a tuna is you know um you have to know what sort of time of year they're going to be around and then right. you just need to be out there yeah. that's the key is just be out there um i had a great quote from a, a famous photographer a little while ago who said the secret to filming wildlife is f stop eight and be there and <laughs> being well, being there is the the, the most important bit you know uh, the f we, stop being so that you can freeze the the them where they are it's enough light so that you can or your you depth can, of field yeah uh, but i water. mean you know that's that's sort of hard to control the lower you go in the in the water no uh, yeah, it is. That's where things like natural light or using artificial lights, that's where you have to start um, do you have, paying more attention. Do you have an assistant go with you? Do you have like a, a gaffer? Like you have all your team Gaffer down? of the sea. So I, mean, I think you might have broken up just slightly on that one. Oh no, do you have somebody go with you? Oh yes, always. Yeah, yeah. Right. How um, many people? How, how many, many people do you have somebody down? hold a light while you're down there? <laughs> no, my camera has, uh, has nice, uh, nice stands for the lights. Um, I mean, the, the work that I'm doing at the moment in the Mediterranean with things like the sperm whales and the mantas and things like that, um, there is a team of us. We have a multimedia team of which I'm um, underwater cinematographer, but we also have a guy with a 360 camera 
yeah. uh, underwater photographer, right. usually a safety diver. So yeah. There's... Now, are you are you communicating on mics while you're doing that? No, nope, all all just with hand signals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because imagine you're you're crossing each other's shots all the time. No, um, we try to avoid that. Um, we're quite good good at that. And if a photographer wants to get a certain shot, they'll usually um, they'll they'll talk about it beforehand. But also from my side of things. I actually quite like having someone in the shop. Um, and I learned this way back when I was just getting videos of sharks because having a great image of an animal is wonderful. It looks amazing. But if you can put a person in that image and have that animal alongside them, then it's far more relatable, but there's also more of a story. And always the more powerful photos are the ones where them. For the best example I can think of is that I, I, I mentioned that I'm known for a, uh, a photo I, I took a photo of a huge jellyfish in mm. the uk and i took quite a few photos of it by itself and it what is, is that huge. a manta ray oh, oh right i know this photo this is a famous photo yeah Can where, we where there's a person in the foreground so that the manta is just what is it a man of war what's it called that jellyfish? uh oh the portuguese man of war yeah no this is yeah. um a, called a bowel jellyfish i might be able to right, find which, it and it's right. and it's it's huge right so that yeah the this, person in the foreground makes it seem like it's a giant uh Ooh, let's giant... Find it. yeah, yeah you know, i looked at that photo and i wondered yeah you, you wonder because it gives you scale but you're not sure of the scale because oh, i got like it that... i mean that image went viral like it went yeah. crazy uh in places that i was not <laughs> expecting um but if that was just a photo of a jellyfish i don't think it would have done anywhere near what it what ended up doing the fact that there's now a... how did you how did you get on to this how did you even know it was there Oh, we stumbled across it by accident on a scuba dive off the coast of mm. Falmouth. <laughs> I mean, on I mean, the last day of a film shoot. That is a you big. Know, yeah, now is that guy afraid that he's going to touch one of those tentacles, or does he know to just no matter what, stay away? Um, so this is my friend Lizzie, um, the wildlife presenter, and mm -hmm. she she knew what it was. Uh, I did not, but my my job isn't to know what it is. My job is to get the shot. So yeah, so these ones actually, which I learned afterwards, they're not um, particularly dangerous. Uh, mm -hmm. If you were to touch one of those tentacles on the bottom there, you wouldn't really feel anything. I'm told it's kind of like a wasp sting. So it's not a, it's not. So a do you problem. signal her to go behind the jellyfish? Cause you could do that with the shot in front, you could do it with in back, you could do it above. Yeah, You know, how absolutely. do you find that? That's, that's yeah, that that's the challenge actually. And, and that's what I feel actually my, that's my job. My job is to, get as many creative angles as I can, whether that's a close, a wide, a different angle. I mean, this, the good thing about a jellyfish is they're not moving very fast, mm -hmm. unlike something like a dolphin or a shark where you're working to different parameters. But a jellyfish, it's pretty much going quite slowly. So you can put yourself in front of it and get that shot that you need or the shot down or the shot up. Um, How many people are in the water with you right there? That's just me and Lizzie. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, this was the end of um, a filming shoot that we did in the UK, highlighting mm -hmm. uh, marine life around the UK. The funny behind the scenes about this particular one is if you look closely at um, Lizzie's face, she's pressing the dive mask onto her face with her hand. Mm -hmm. um, that's because the mask was um, was leaking <laughs> so mm -hmm. much. Um, well, the water was stuck to her eyes. Like it's it. obviously so was... huge. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. a huge problem in America, people leaking out of the mask and getting yeah. corona, you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, those waters around England, people don't go in them that much. Do, they don't do that much scuba diving. Um, How did that feel being down there, you know? Yeah, it's not, it's not the, wor the, like the world's most popular diving area. There are places mm -hmm. where there are quite a few dive sites. Um, there's a few wrecks as well, but certainly for wildlife, it's not. Um, particularly well known which is kind of why we wanted to do it to to try and highlight some of the wildlife that you can see um, although it's tremendously there are a lot of animals in there yeah and i i underestimated the uk when it came to marine wildlife until i did that film shoot yeah um, there was some of the most amazing uh, amazing moments with some spectacular creatures are you you know like seals seabirds yeah you know, this has really grabbed you. You're always interested in it, but I guess in 2014 or 16, you got incredibly interested in it, and now it's it's become your life. Do you think you're you're always going to be in the sea? Are you? Is is it like are you going to take the Sylvia Earle pathway or the Jacques Cousteau sort of pathway and just always be in the ocean now? I think so. Yeah, I think this is one of those things where 
once it's got hold of you, there's not really many alternatives left. Uh, yeah, I. This is 100% my focus, 100% my passion. Um, I feel lost when I haven't been in the ocean for longer than a week. Mm. Um, yeah, this is definitely where I feel most alive, 100%. Is there something you want to see that you haven't seen yet? Like, what's your dream? You know, whether it's a shark or a whale, what is, is there something you really want to go get? Um, specifically right now, I haven't seen a, a shark in the Mediterranean. Um, I've been here for a year and a half and the only shark I've seen has been a dead one. Um, so to try and film a shark is right now at the top of my list. There are sharks here. They're just really difficult to find. Mm. Um, one, because the Mediterranean is quite vast, but also because sharks are in serious decline here as they are in a lot of places. Yeah. And so actually finding them is really difficult. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of a sad story, I guess, but um, trying to find sharks here is, is, is top of the list at the moment. Nice. Okay, we hope you find well, one safely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Be, yeah. be well. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Bye, guys. guys.